Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. Hope um, you are doing well. If somebody can do me a solid and just write into the chat function that you can see and hear me, that's always incredibly helpful to know that I'm not just talking to um, talking into the void. Um, so if someone could do that for me, that'd be extremely good. Um, if you also let me know where you're from, where you're listening from, Oh, look, Trudy, Matt, Trudy, well done. You're fastest on the uh, on the chat function. Thank you for that. Uh, let me know where you're listening from, uh, what you're interested in, Fogmalgia. Hopefully we're going to cover it uh, this evening. I'm just going to give a minute or so for people to find the link um, in their email inboxes, et cetera, and join us. A little bit of orientation to the platform. Moira can see me even better. Good for you, Moira. Um, the uh, bit of orientation to the platform. Hopefully you will be able to see the slides and also my face um, and hear me nicely. If you look to the right hand side of that, you will see the chat function where people are writing, like Kate has said she is tuning in. Um, and then on the chat function, you can write what you like in there, um, hopefully pleasant and supportive. And then just above that, you will see there's a Q&A function as well. Um, so any questions that you have for me, which I will try and get through as many of them as I can at the end of the webinar, um, then pop them in the Q&A function. Um, you can also vote up and down your favorite ones in the Q&A function as well. Um, if someone else has asked a question you think is particularly good as well. Um, and I will get to that in approximately 30 minutes time is the plan. Um, if you miss any of this recording then or webinar, then um, I will be putting it up on my YouTube channel. Um, you can find that just type rheumatology.physio into uh, YouTube and I should come up there and you'll be able to watch that. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get that up tomorrow. Um, that's the plan. Um, but something else might get in the way. So I'm not making any promises, but I'm hoping to get that up tomorrow. Um, and you will receive a link to that recording as well. So hello to everybody who is saying hi in the chat function. Thank you very much for that. Let's get cracking talking about fibromyalgia. Um, so we, over the next 30 minutes-ish, are going to talk about the etiology um, or who fibromyalgia effects. Um, then we are going to talk about diagnostics for fibromyalgia, um, talk a little bit around differential diagnosis, um, who we might want to refer for further investigations um, or ask further questions of. Um, and then I'm going to try to cover some of the practicalities of making a diagnosis um, and how we might use fibromyalgia as a diagnosis um, to our advantage um, in healthcare. I think that it's possible a lot of people are scared of the diagnosis of fibromyalgia and maybe want to run for the hills when they have a patient who is diagnosed. So um, we're going to go for that. I'm not going to cover treatment for fibromyalgia in this webinar. Um, that is not necessarily my particular skill set. Um, I'm much more on a differential diagnosis side of things. Um, hello to those people who are still continuing to say hi in the chat function. Thank you very much for that. And um, let's crack on. So fibromyalgia itself um, it is affecting approximately 2% of the population worldwide, which is quite a lot of people. So it's twice as um, prevalent as rheumatoid arthritis. It's as prevalent as rheumatoid arthritis and all types of spondyloarthritis combined. Um, so it's really affecting quite a lot of people. Now, who it affects, um, it predominantly affects females. Um, and typically, we're going to see our oh, females being diagnosed with fibromyalgia between the ages of about 30 and 50. Um, although, of course, we do see people younger and we do see people who are older. Um, we will see some males being diagnosed with fibromyalgia as well. But typically, it's our female population between the ages of 30 and 50. There are a few things that make you more likely to be diagnosed with fibromyalgia in your past medical history. And those are things like um, recurrent unwellness of pretty much any flavor. So whether that is uh, sort of systemic unwellness through um, 
infections or um, other metabolic issues like diabetes um, or in fact um, the things that I deal with like inflammatory arthritis um, or or traumatic injuries why um, especially multiple traumas make people more likely to be diagnosed with fibromyalgia um, but also things like um, anxiety and depression, um, illness as a child, um, those kind of things do seem to prime people to be diagnosed with fibromyalgia as they get a bit older. Um, so the definition of fibromyalgia, and we'll go on to talk about diagnostics, of course, a bit later. Um, the definition is persistent widespread pain, um, and it's accompanied by fatigue and sleep disturbance. Um, impaired physical function and psychological distress. So theoretically, if you only had persistent widespread pain, you do not have fibromyalgia. Um, if you only had fatigue and sleep disturbance, you would not have fibromyalgia. And we do see some of these various different diagnoses out around um, out and around the healthcare system. Um, so we'll see things like chronic fatigue syndrome, which usually would, wouldn't be um, accompanied by so much pain. Um, or we might see sort of chronic um, or persistent low back pain, uh, not necessarily associated with things like psychological distress. Um, so we're going to um, see some various other diagnoses as well. But the fibromyalgia one, we're going to get the widespread pain and these other symptoms as well. Um, so we um, are looking at this combination of symptoms, and I think this is what potentially scares our healthcare professionals um, quite a lot uh, when people come in, because obviously not only have they got all this pain across around their body, um, but also we're dealing with things like the fatigue and the sleep disturbance. And of course, if we want to do things like provide exercise programs, um, different bits and pieces like that, um, and then we are concerned about uh, making that fatigue worse with people using more um, energy or uh, the patient themselves is concerned about that um, as well. So um, it can be quite difficult to get into doing things like the uh, treatment programs, etc. But then, of course, we are also not um, psychologists. So the psychological distress, um, okay, mentioned anxiety, depression, um, a lot of patients report things like brain fog, and that's not necessarily within our um, general skill set to be managing um, as well. So often, um, we're a bit sort of out of our depth from that point of view. Not everybody, obviously, some some therapists are extremely good at that. Um, but other people, we don't, we're not going to see quite so many people um, with those kind of symptoms. So it can be difficult to manage this sort of um, multifaceted um, process. And as we go on to talk about in a second, of course, it can be associated with other clinical diagnoses as well. So not only are you managing these um, symptoms of uh, the fibromyalgia, but also an underlying disease as well. Just noticing in the chat, a couple of people struggling with sound. Um, if you are struggling with sound or the picture, then and you're not using a Chrome browser, a Google Chrome browser, then that usually fixes um, the any problems. So um, let's just uh, just going to type that in. Try using a Chrome browser. Just realised I'm saying use a Chrome browser and they can't hear me. Um, okay, so um, on to the next component. So we do have two uh, types of fibromyalgia. Um, so we would have primary fibromyalgia, and um, this would be in the absence of other clear clinical entities. So this is relatively, I would say, unusual that someone wouldn't have an underlying um, clinical entity alongside, as we've already mentioned, things like diabetes or an inflammatory arthritis, um, those kinds of conditions. So they purely develop um, this widespread pain, psychological distress and sleep disturbances without any other underlying illnesses. Um, 
I would say the people who develop that kind of condition, they tend to be those people who have had a lot of either anxiety or depression um, or past trauma, in especially in their childhood. Um, that tends to be the issue. So in this definition, I suppose, is are they um, is is this primary fibromyalgia in the presence of no other pain generating conditions, if that's a phrase, um, or is this primary fibromyalgia in the absence of any other um, features of unwellness? Um, so those are that's fairly unusual to get primary fibromyalgia, but of course it does happen. Um, the more much more common um, type of fibromyalgia would be the secondary fibromyalgia. And this is where a lot of the guidelines have changed in recent history. Um, so this would be following or alongside another clinical entity. So for me, in my specialism of rheumatology, um, I would see a lot of fibromyalgia diagnoses in people with um, axial spondyloarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, those kinds of inflammatory diseases, uh, lupus and the connective tissue disorders, because these cause widespread pain over an extended period of time. And this will sensitize the system and people will then develop these fibromyalgia um, symptoms or this secondary fibromyalgia, especially those diseases which cause a lot of fatigue alongside as well. So we will see a lot of this. Now, what changed in sort of relatively recent history is that um, fibromyalgia used to be this diagnosis of exclusion so it would only you would have fibromyalgia if you had no other underlying disease to so rule out other underlying diseases and be left with fibromyalgia as the cause of the symptoms and it's changed to having it alongside these others so this concomitant uh, fibromyalgia alongside other diseases and what this means is that it takes away or hopefully takes away this sort of um, impression that the fibromyalgia is this fobbing off diagnosis where you're only going to get it if you've got nothing really causing the symptoms, as an example, it's all in your head or whatever else uh, might be insinuated by having that. So having it alongside the other clinical entities means that it's uh, the idea is that it's going to validate this as a diagnosis and hopefully uh, make it more appropriate um, to patients. Now, what it also means on the flip side of that is, as I mentioned, if you take a lot of, especially people with things like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, um, which causes widespread pains, um, can also cause a lot of fatigue um, and uh, poor sleep because it's waking people in the night, then what will happen is um, you might satisfy the criteria for fibromyalgia um, just because you have this inflammatory disorder. And that's what we're going to go and talk about right at the end is the practicalities of using fibromyalgia as a diagnosis. Um, but it's really important to understand this um, this process of it potentially um, being alongside other in diseases, not just as this diagnosis of exclusion, which it was um, previously thought of. So really important to understand that. Um, one final thing I want to mention on this uh, particular thing uh, before we move on is just because someone has fibromyalgia, even if it's primary, doesn't mean they can't get another uh, disease or another cause of pain or fatigue, etc. Um, or it doesn't mean they don't have an undiagnosed um, other clinical disease as well. So we must still remain vigilant in these patients and make sure we're still assessing them appropriately and properly, which might sound silly and obvious to say, but we do see a lot of patients um, who a lot of symptoms are put down to fibromyalgia when actually it's not. So the guidelines for fibromyalgia state the following, we need to make it as soon as possible. Um, so the earlier we give the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, the better. And this relates to not um, waiting to basically see if things improve or um, or change. Um, and then 
any clinician can make the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So it's certainly not limited to um, consultants or rheumatologists or anything like that. Anybody who um, makes it, deems it appropriate that um, the patient has got fibromyalgia and they satisfy the criteria, et cetera, you can make that diagnosis. We must communicate it to the patient. Um, so make sure we're spending pr appropriate amount of time um, getting across the information, hopefully getting them to understand what we are diagnosing them with and why. Um, and we need to support that with written information as well. And I'm sure many of you can appreciate if you've seen someone with fibromyalgia and they have particularly a lot of fatigue or brain fog, they don't retain um, information uh, particularly well anyway and we know that a lot of information is not retained by all patients when they attend a clinical appointment so it must be supported with written information um, and this really goes towards making sure we are if you're making the diagnosis it's not then forgotten about and it's not uh, it doesn't come as a surprise to patients at a later date uh, that it's found in their notes by someone, um, those kind of things, but also making sure that they have sufficient time and sufficient energy appro appropriately given to making sure they understand what the diagnosis is and why it's been happening. And of course, as I mentioned, supporting that with the written information as well. So how do we go about making the diagnosis? What are the practicalities of this? So if you've been in clinical practice for any period of time, then you will know that previously fibromyalgia was diagnosed using pressure point testing. And um, so you would push onto certain areas of the patient's body, the upper shoulders and the upper arms and the lower back and the thighs and the calves and this kind of thing. And you'd push. And if the patient reported that that was painful and they had a certain number of areas where you pushed on it and it was painful, then um, they would have widespread pain. And there we go. They would and maybe they're a bit tired as well. Um, there we they would get um, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So um, this is the old style way of doing it. And as you can imagine, as I explained that, that's rife with um, people being able to make mistakes. So how hard do you push? You could push as hard. If you pushed hard enough, you could make pretty much everybody um, have a lot of pain. So how hard do you push? Do you push it? Where exactly do you push? Uh, when should you do that? When in the patient's journey should you do that? Is it different during the day? Is it different during different days of the week? So on and so forth. So it was pretty inaccurate way of doing it um, and it didn't work particularly well. So the great news is they came up with this uh, fibromyalgia syndrome diagnostic worksheet. And I'm going to pop the link into the chat here for you if you want to get that. Uh, but I will also send the link out in the follow up email for this webinar. Notice a couple of people still struggling a little bit with audio. Hopefully that's not across the board and that's local. Um, and I will um, make um, the slide deck available for you as well. Um, and there will be a recording on uh, YouTube, hopefully from tomorrow. Um, so you'll be able to find that and you'll get a link in the emails for that as well. So the diagnostic worksheet um, has boiled down a lot of the questions that were previously asked for fibromyalgia into a usable one sided sheet. Um, excellent. Some people are still hearing well, so hopefully it is local issues, um, is boiled down into this one-sided sheet, um, which is quite useful and easy to use. So if we quickly have a look through this, you get at the top, there are two components to making the diagnosis. So we have the symptom severity scale, which is sort of the top half of the sheet or top two thirds of the sheet. Um, and then you get the widespread pain index score as well. Um, and you score that um, and you score both components. And hopefully when they score that up, then you can use those scores to make the diagnosis or not make the diagnosis. Um, it's quite a lot easier. Um, so previously, there was a whole laundry list of um, questions that would be asked. And to be honest, it was pretty clunky and it took forever. Uh, it wasn't very good. Whereas this is far better. So at the beginning, uh, we've got, is the pain persistent? So has it been there for three months or more? Yes or no? Fairly easy question to answer. Um, and then we get um, questions on fatigue, um, trouble thinking and remembering or waking up um, tired or refreshed. And we score those between zero and three. 
Um, and then during the past six months, have they got any other types of uh, any other of the following symptoms, pain or cramps in the abdomen um, depression or headaches? And what you can see, hopefully from that is that really looks at covering um, the other symptoms that aren't sort of pain, if that makes sense. So um, other uh, widespread type symptoms like fatigue and waking, refreshed and those kind of things. So um, we would score that um, on the symptom severity scale. Um, and that um, is is really how we go about that. Um, and then we have the body map, um, which um, we would use to um, do the widespread pain index. So instead of pushing now, what we're doing is we're asking the patient where the pain is. Um, and then we will we will sort of shade in on the body map where with a reporting pain. And you can see at the bottom, what you do is you then score where they've put in the different pain areas. Um, so you tick it. So if it's on, on the far left side, if there's left jaw, left shoulder girdle, left upper arm, etc., and then you tick it. And obviously, the more of those they have, um, the more um, widespread pain they have. Um, so I've, I've zoomed in on the little box here. So we're looking obviously at over three months. And then we're looking at a widespread pain index. So that bottom score of seven or more and symptom severity scale of five or more. So that would constitute a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. But we've also now got a got this um, diff slightly different uh, uh, way of scoring it where a lower widespread pain index. Um, so you can have less areas of the body affected but with a higher symptom severity score so four to six on the widespread pain index and the symptom severity scale of nine or more um, then you're able to still diagnose fibromyalgia so what we would previously have in the old diagnostics would be this uh, bias towards the pain Whereas now what we're able to do is if patients don't have quite so much pain, but they've got these other symptoms, um, then you can still use, you can still diagnose fibromyalgia. So if fatigue is the main problem, for example, then you'll still be able to diagnose fibromyalgia. Um, and what can be quite useful here is not only can you use this diagnostically, but you could use this at a later date to assess the uh, effectiveness of treatment, for example. Um, or if you've got a patient who you're a bit unsure of, you score it one time and then you could score it again at a later date. Um, so you could do multiple um, uses of the scoring sheet. Um, and then we might find that that changes over time, either it one way or another um, might help make your um make your diagnostic decisions as well. So as you can see, it's pretty quick to fill out. Um, it's pretty easy to score. Um, and then you can use that to make your diagnosis. If someone satisfies that criteria, then uh, you can make that diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And as I mentioned, anybody, any clinician can make that diagnosis. Um, so the, as I mentioned, I've pop, popped into the chat. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be in the link uh, below in the comments. Um, but the link there, that takes you to the guidelines. It's really interesting to read the guidelines of how they created this sheet, um, but also the download for that sheet is there as well. So, Let's talk about practicality of using the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So as I talked about a little bit earlier, a lot of my patients who have things like axial spondyloarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, they would satisfy the criteria for fibromyalgia on that previous worksheet. Now, am I going to diagnose all my patients with fibromyalgia? Probably not. Um, there are some patients where it's going to be useful and there are some patients where it's not going to be useful. Um, and you kind of have to make a decision on an individual basis where that is. So for me, I'll give you an example. Um, if I have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and they've had rheumatoid arthritis for quite a long time and objectively, so on uh, blood testing and maybe on ultrasound scanning, um, they don't have any obvious continuation of inflammation. 
Um, so they've not got uh, high inflammatory markers and they've not got synovitis on ultrasound, but they're still reporting lots of ongoing pain and fatigue, then fibromyalgia may well be a very good answer as to why they're continuing to get these symptoms. It's not their disease activity from the rheumatoid arthritis, but it is from fibromyalgia type symptoms, this winding up or this sensitization of the system causing this continuation of long-term symptoms. So in that case, it might well be a very useful thing to do rather than thinking, oh my goodness, I need to keep sending this patient to rheumatology for more medication or so on and so forth. The fibromyalgia diagnosis there can be very useful. So we need to continue to be suspicious as we see patients, especially patients who have had symptoms of um, diseases for a very long time. What is happening to their system? Are they developing widespread pain? Are they developing this fatigue, um, brain fog, those kinds of questions? So um, we need to be suspicious that they may well be developing fibromyalgia. I'm also going to leave be suspicious in there for what about those patients who have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and then get new symptoms? We need to be suspicious of other underlying conditions or in fact, misdiagnosis. So it's estimated that a possible 16% of fibromyalgia patients are actually misdiagnosed spondyloarthritis patients. So there is, a, there is this potential that it, the fibromyalgia itself is a misdiagnosis and something underlying is causing the symptoms and needs managing. Diagnostic timing, I think, is very important. Now, um, as mentioned, the guidelines would state we need to make this fibromyalgia diagnosis as soon as possible. And as a blanket rule, that tends to be a good idea. But as I've mentioned, there are ex there are periods of time where you may not make that diagnosis immediately, even if the patient has had symptoms for three months. If the patient has an underlying disease which is not well managed, so go back to my rheumatoid arthritis example, if they still have ongoing inflammation, uh, ongoing um, synovitis, increased ESR, um, CRP, for example, and there is the potential that this can be significantly improved with an increase in medication or a change in medication or changes in lifestyle, then it may well be that you hold off on the fibromyalgia diagnosis because it's then unhelpful to label that patient with that diagnosis when actually other medications or, or changes to treatments might help their underlying condition and they may then later not satisfy that fibromyalgia criteria. So there are some just changes and tweaks that you might make um, at that time, depending on the individual patient. Um, if they've had particularly severe trauma or significant surgeries that mean they have uh, have quite a long recovery period, then you may want to de de uh, delay the diagnosis until they've recovered or taken some rehab and things have improved. Um, things like also um, thyroid dysfunction, you might want to delay diagnosing it until they've had um, other um, underlying conditions monitored and, and treated to see what happens to the, to the symptoms there. I think we, if we're making the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, we must always use this as a gateway to educating the patient. So I don't think we should ever say, you've got fibromyalgia, off you go. Um, I don't think many people would, but I think we need to lay out a treatment plan and we need to have a plan as to what we're going to do now we've diagnosed that patient with fibromyalgia. Um, so here are some resources. As we talked about, these are written resources as well, but here is a treatment plan that we, we or a person I'm referring you to will go through to try to improve the symptoms and help you to manage. Uh, make sure they have that in place at the time of giving them the diagnosis. If we don't, they can feel very left on their own and very left out in the dark, which isn't surprising when you just land this sort of diagnosis on them without this onward forward planning. The uh, uh, As I mentioned, this is regards to treatment. Now, the evidence for the treatments are sketchy um, and, and potentially not that overly effective. So what are we going to do 
with the treatment for the patients and the individual. And I think if you don't know on the individual basis, then it might be something that you delay giving them the diagnosis until you know what you're going to do from a treatment point of view, or you might um, at least refer them out to someone with specialist knowledge on how they're going to do that. So I think we need to be very judicious with how and when we provide this diagnosis make sure we've got appropriate plans in place so patients don't feel like oh i've got fibromyalgia there's nothing i can do about it because what we're doing is we're then laying out this roadmap in front of them of how they can um, go on to try and manage these different symptoms so I think I've brought that in just about in time, 29 minutes, about spot on for my my target of uh, 30 minutes talking about fibromyalgia. Um, so I am going to go on to do uh, some questions and answers. Um, and hopefully there are some in here. And the first question I don't know the answer to, which is really uh, not um, not ideal. Um, so Dina has, uh, has asked the question, how sensitive is the diagnostic uh, worksheet? I don't know the specific answer to that question, Dina. I haven't um, looked into it um, on the um, link that I sent you on that specific answer. Uh, but because the uh, the way it was developed, the idea was that what they've done is they've taken uh, the, a whole lot of questions which they've narrowed down um, uh, from the laundry list of questions to the ones that have the, the most sensitivity in combination um, to try to make the, the, it practical and as sensitive as possible. So um, it, it, it is reasonably sensible if my, if uh, if that's a an acceptable answer, um, but um, I don't know the specific answer on the, you know, I couldn't tell you it's 90% sensitive, for example, without going looking that up. A uh, couple of people just popping questions into the regular chat. If you can put your questions in the Q&A, um, that would be awesome. Um, so next question uh, we've got from Anne. One of the times people get misdiagnosed with fibromyalgia is when it's perimenopause slash menopause. Uh, do you know the prevalence of this? Is um, is it the sixteen percent mentioned, or was that specific to spondyloarthritis? So that that number is specific to spondyloarthritis, and um, obviously um, menopause, women's health is not my area of specialty, so I don't know the specifics on that number. Um, but yes, I can imagine that those uh, periods of time are going to um, cause very similar symptoms. Um, and that is a possible misdiagnosis. But of course, it can also be a concurrent diagnosis with perimenopause and menopause as well. Um, so we're not, you know, ignoring one versus the other. Um, Adam, good, good friend Adam Dobson's asked, duloxetine recently shown to have potential utility for persistent pain. What's your views on secondary medical management with medicines like this? So, um, not again, not my area of expertise, but I would say that um, if patients have or people have underlying conditions, they're manage, managing those appropriately is going to make an effect on the underlying symptoms. So um, again, if we if we come back to my area of safety um, in the inflammatory conditions, then if you have uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and you treat that with uh, medication, uh, disease modifying medication, then things like the pain and the uh, fatigue will likely improve. Um, and then that may well, of course, improve the fibromyalgic symptoms. So with things like, um, we've seen things like uh, gabapentin used in patients with fibromyalgia and um, antidepressants and those kinds of things. And uh, obviously you're mentioning duloxetine specifically. What I'm guessing that those are doing is as much as they might be settling the general uh, nervous system um, and the sensitization of the nervous system, um, then they're also likely treating underlying um, components as well. As I mentioned right at the beginning, um, a lot of patients with fibromyalgia are going to have concurrent anxiety and or depression as well. So I think it's definitely valid whether you would 
try and treat fibromyalgia with those kind of medications without evidence of those underlying conditions that is definitely outside of my uh, my skill set and pay grade for that answer that question uh, James has asked thoughts of the condition being autoimmune or neuroinflammation the trouble is I think James here we are gonna have a lot of subsets of patients um, so you are definitely going to get so we, again if let's go to my area of safety and the inflammatory conditions we know that if you have persistent inflammation in an area of the body your that area will be sensitized and we also know that the central nervous system will be sensitized through peripheral inflammation um we also know that those conditions are autoimmune or autoinflammatory so in that kind of situation, of, I would absolutely say um, that the fibromyalgia is caused by those kind of symptoms. Now, is all types of fibromyalgia caused by that? I wouldn't like to guess. Um, I think there's definitely going to be different components um, for different people. And, you know, we see, as far as my understanding goes, things like anxiety and depression having some biological causes as well um, as just... I don't know, I'm going to use inverted commas, pure psychological causes. Um, so I think it's going to be different across the board. So I'm going to sit on the fence there and say, uh, I think potentially in some people it is and in other people it's not. Um, Joanne's asked, can people make a full recovery or is this considered a lifelong condition? I, again, I think that would vary on the individual and I think that would vary on the situation in which they sit both with onset and um both with onset and what happens during the diagnosis but also things like delay to diagnosis and um, that kind of thing i definitely think people can make a recovery um how many of them can make a recovery i don't know um i've worked with people who have recovered um and it also depends on what you define as a recovery as well. So are, have they got zero pain, zero fatigue, or are they back to full function? Um, but I definitely think people can can recover. Um, Zoe's asked, reasonable medical tests to consider prior to a fibromyalgia diagnosis. Um, so that's a really good question for which I think we could talk about for a long period of time. Oh, Josh has asked a very similar question. You need to consider the individual and you also need to consider why are you doing the test that you're doing. So I wouldn't suggest a blanket set of bloods or imaging, etc. So let's say, um, let's give you an example. Let's say you've got a female patient who's 35 and she attends with widespread pain. Now, if she also had psoriasis then i would say we need to be looking at and ruling out a spondyloarthritis as the cause in which case you would do inflammatory markers hla b27 testing you might ultrasound scan her um insertions of the achilles tendons if she's got any inflammatory sounding symptoms to her back pain you might mri um, her back um if as we mentioned earlier, you've got a lady or a female who's a little bit older and potentially they are around the time of the perimenopause. That might change your investigations again. Uh, if you've got a patient with a past medical history or a family history of certain types of cancers, that might change your investigations. So what I'm what I'm trying to say is when you're investigating, you would be investigating based on what your patient is presenting with and the potential diagnoses they may may have that is again it's not remember we this is where it's not now a diagnosis of exclusion so you're investigating to see if there are other clinical entities in place um, and if you don't have any symptoms which are guiding you towards another clinical entity then you're not testing for that if that makes sense. Um, Dominic's asked, wouldn't an MRI determine whether or not a patient had axial spondyloarthritis versus fibromyalgia? Uh, no, 
uh, not in everybody. Um, patients with a diagnosis of axial spondyloarthritis quite commonly have negative MRIs, um, so that's not definitive. Um, and I'd be very careful relying on MRI uh, for diagnosing axial spondyloarthritis. If you're suspicious of someone having axial spondyloarthritis, then they need to go see a rheumatologist. Um, right, we'll do a couple more. Um, some of the questions have moved. Have you been voting them? Um, Let's go. Um, uh, Ben's asked, uh, what will differentiate fibromyalgia from an undifferentiated, undifferentiated connective tissue disease? Ben, I've got an entire course that you can attend to try and uh, make that decision. Um, so with, an un, uh, with a connective tissue disorder, so a bit like we were talking about a minute ago, we're looking for other symptoms that might push us towards an under, uh, a connective tissue disorder. So uh, we're looking for particularly things like rashes, um, other um, organ involvement, particularly the kidneys um, or clotting disorders. Um, other symptoms might be dry eyes, dry mouth, those kinds of things, or specific um, arthralgias. Uh, would push us towards that. And then with specifically with an undifferentiated connective tissue disorder, uh, we would then be looking for a positive uh, blood test on some of the autoantibodies or um, inflammatory markers. Um, so yes, difficult how we would do that, but we still want to be looking for specific symptoms uh, related to the connective tissue disorder. The other thing I would add in there would be a family history of connective tissue disorders. Um, let me just run down my list here of questions. Um, they keep moving as you're at. You're, I'm, I'm delighted that you're um, delighted that you're voting on them. But they keep shifting them up and down the list out of my uh, eye line. Um, done that one. Done that one. Uh, Jessica's asked, "What are the most common misdiagnoses that I see?" Um, well, they're because I see a biased subset of patients, they're mostly rheumatological, and I would say they're almost all spondyloarthritis, uh, so either axial or peripheral. Um, and the key with the ones that I see are people have not linked the fact that the patient has either psoriasis, ulcerative colitis, or Crohn's disease, which are the common ones in the female population. They've not linked that with the multiple joint pains and the widespread pain uh, together, or they've not asked it. And um, so they that means that they don't suspect the spondyloarthritis. So that's the one that that's the ones that I see most of. Um, uh, apologies if I'm uh, butchering your name a little bit, but Aditya has asked, how can we differentiate between early development of polymyalgia rheumatica versus fibromyalgia at primary care level to avoid any late complications of PMR? So um, one early early onset PMR is extremely rare. Um, so it's very very rare to get um, polymyalgia rheumatica under the age of 50. Um, so that would be one way if the patient's under the age of 50, they almost certainly don't have PMR. Um, the other thing with PMR is um, you get a very specific onset. So it's an acute onset of bilateral shoulder pain that's going to occur in 90% of patients. And also they will have a raised ESR or uh, CRP level. So um, you really shouldn't um, be misdiagnosing polymyalgia rheumatica as a rheum as um as fibromyalgia um again i've got an entire um online course about that which we go into that in specifics um on how we would deal with polymyalgia rheumatica um so i think i've got time i'm going to do one more question um uh, Josh, this is a really nice question, actually. Um, with regards to bloods, would I routinely look to rule out vitamin deficiencies before considering the diagnosis or not? That is a lovely question. Um, if you were um, if you were doing a battery of blood tests, then I think putting in uh, B12 and vitamin D would be a good idea. Um, my experience is with these patients, when you have those vitamin deficiencies, if you resolve them, so let's say they're vitamin uh, B12 deficient, and you resolve the 
B12 deficiency. It doesn't tend to make a massive difference to the symptoms. So in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, you will see an improvement in symptoms, but it's not sort of run for the hills, brilliant improvement. Um, and I see the same if patients have sort of these widespread pain and they satisfy this fibromyalgia criteria, then with the vitamin deficiency, if you resolve that, they seem to get some improvement, but it's not um, absolutely incredible improvement. So um, I would, but if you've not got it, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be ruling in or ruling out fibromyalgia based on a positive or a negative vitamin deficiency test, if that makes sense. Um, I'm just going to quickly look into the chat now. Lovely. Great. Um, so that we're done 45 minutes, which I'm delighted with. Hopefully you've all found that really useful. Um, what I will do is everybody who um, has registered, I'm going to send an email. You're going to get a link to the recording. I'll send out the slide deck. Um, please do check out the website, rheumatology.physio. There's also a discount code there if you see that. If you use Fibro, um, over the next 24 hours, you can get anything in the shop, including the online course. So if you're particularly interested in differentially diagnosing um, into rheumatology, um, then please go there, you get 20% off. And I've forgotten the exact offer I've done on the online course, but it's 20% off and I'll send you a book as well, um, if my memory serves. Um, the online course is, I like to think, absolutely brilliant, runs to about uh, 14 hours at the moment um, of differential diagnosis and treatment of rheumatology disorders. And there's also the shop, uh, which has some books um, and bits and pieces on there. Uh, like I said, I've got a YouTube channel, podcasts, follow me on social media. Um, you probably found me via that for this webinar. I am going to do, uh, I'm going to do another webinar next month um, in a similar vein. I haven't chosen a topic yet, uh, but look out for that. I'll uh, invite you to that. Um, if anybody's got any topics they fancy me covering, do give me a shout um, and I'll see if I fancy doing that one. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to let you all get on with your evenings. Thank you very much for spending the best part of 45 minutes listening to me. Um, thank you very much for all your questions. Any that I did miss in the Q&A, I will try and answer on uh, social media. Um, I know I've missed a couple um, through time and also with them jumping around. I haven't noticed them jumping around this Q&A function before, which is a bit, um, bit of a pain in the backside. Uh, so there's that. But otherwise, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good evening. And yeah, find me on socials, etc. Bye for now.